The Spotlight, shining a light on podcasts and videos that have caught our attention. Hi and welcome to The Spotlight. My name is Jen Spiker and today I'll be highlighting more of a video from the recent Answers in Genesis Living in Babylon Australian tour. Ken Ham and Martin Isles visited four capital cities. They shared a series of messages exploring the idea that we live in a modern-day equivalent of Babylon. Today, we'll hear more of Martin Isle's first message to a capacity crowd in Adelaide, explaining why Babylon is more relevant now than ever. The Spotlight with Jen Spiker. And Daniel's perspective is quite different. It's a refreshing perspective by comparison. He reflects on what happened uh, and, and, and he gives to us just a, a, the perspective that he's gained on it in a few sentences at the start of the book of Daniel. He's kind of gotten over himself and he sees a bigger picture and he describes the advent of this new era into which he has been thrown in this way. He says, The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand with part of the vessels of the house of God. In other words, he is saying, this is the day that the Lord has made. That's his perspective. He's saying, whatever condition I found myself in, God has permitted it. Whatever the situation, God has something for me to do. Um, And what follows is an unfolding of the forward movement of the kingdom of God through Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in this brand new context, whilst Babylon is here for a while. That was their calling, that, this was their time. And it's your time and it's my time as well. Um, you know, it's one of the favourite verses of Christians at the moment. You, you hear it repeated, actually it's in America and here, uh, for such a time as this. Uh, People will look at someone they admire or they'll see a great thing happen and they'll say, oh, for such a time as this. And I want to say, you know, have you ever considered that actually it applies to every one of us here tonight? You were born. You were saved. You are being equipped for such a time as this. And Daniel and his friends embraced the call and they stepped forward in obedience and amazing things happened in Babylon. Let's not be stuck in misery over the past such that we can't see the amazing things that can happen by God's grace and God's work through his servants in Babylon. There's some lessons from history, historical context, parallels if you like. But you know, Babylon also um, became a metaphor. Um, This label Babylon, I say that because uh, Babylon is applied to places other than the Babylon, Tyre and Nineveh and Rome are all called Babylon in Scripture. Uh, The city of Babel is connected very explicitly with Babylon in several places. Uh, That was the first Babylon culture and we learn a lot from its philosophy. I spoke on that in Sydney a little while ago. Um, But also uh, there's a Babylon culture, again a Babylon in the book of Revelation, Uh, the last Babylon culture if you like, And where that is exactly, um, we don't need to get into it tonight, or we will be here a long time, uh, and a lot of people might get very upset, Um, so maybe on another occasion. Um, But this has even caught on in the modern world. Uh, There's a nightclub in Brisbane called Babylon. Um, Not that I've been, but it's a funny story. I was speaking at a pro-life fundraiser, and it happened to be in a venue booked next door to Babylon. Uh, And by the time it came uh, for me to get up and give my speech, uh, the music really started to ramp up and it was kind of moving the wall. Uh, And so I had to, uh, I was being drowned out by Babylon in my pro-life speech. Um, But you see, it's caught on. There's a Hollywood blockbuster movie uh, with very famous people in it called Babylon. Um, What does it mean? Well, when you look at the examples in the Bible, you see that it actually is a certain kind of culture. And the first feature of this certain kind of culture is that it is built on human pride. And you see that actually articulated by the builders of the city of Babel, when they say, come, let us make a name for ourselves. That's their founding philosophy. The greatest thing in this culture, in this civilization, is ourselves, the self. Uh, And of course, once you start going down that dangerous line, and we have today, as we're about to see, 
But once you start going down that dangerous line, you realize that actually it leads you very quickly into a kind of rebellion. Uh, It's a culture which in its pride openly starts to raise itself up against God, and that's the biblical language. Daniel 5 uses that phrase. It tries to become God-like. That's actually the meaning of their project, to build a tower whose top will reach into heaven. These people want to climb onto God's throne and rule with His authority. Babylon wants the power of the state to be as high as it gets, not subject to God and His authority. Babylon wants to flex its power and compete with God by redefining those things that only God can define. Ken has already mentioned some. Uh, There are many, but think of obvious ones. Marriage. Who can define it? Not me, not you, not the state. It was created. Um, Gender. Now that's my sense of who I am, but God made gender. God made a male, and he made female, and he told us what it meant. Family is being redefined, something that only God has the power to define. Human life is being redefined. It sort of starts whenever we want it to start now. If we feel like we want this life, then it's a life that must be protected. If we feel like we don't want this life, then, well, it's our right to terminate it. Um, It's the same, too, increasingly at the end of life. Life not valued as God valued it. One of the things that stands out, actually, in the first nine chapters of Genesis is the incredible importance and value that God puts on a human life. Um, It's only human life that is described. I say this in my book. Here we go. My book. Uh, Available outside. Uh, (laughs) It is made in God's image. No other life is described that way. What an extraordinary thing. Made to image God himself. It's incredible. Also made with life that is directly breathed in by God. Nothing else was made that way. And, you know, that's why we actually possess in our being two kinds of life. Uh, We have a, a biological life which dies once the chemical reactions and the pieces that hold it together fail. But there's another life that hasn't failed. We all have an eternal life, a soul. Um, and I think everybody's aware of this. Uh, this is why people always wonder, what happens after you die? Because they know they're more than biology. They know they're more than chemical reactions. People wonder about things spiritual because they know that they belong to two places, here and somewhere else. Um, human life is so important. And, and in Genesis 9, God gives the hierarchy Uh, where he says, you know, uh, if a human kills a human, then the death penalty is justified. If an animal kills a human, then the animal should also suffer death. Uh, But no human shall shed the blood of another human. Um, But also, humans can eat animals for food. It's all in Genesis 9. It's like he's saying to the whole creation, look up to human life as valuable. But we've redefined that. We're changing those things that only God has the power to define. Uh, It's interesting, the Romans 1 example is the human sexuality example. However we may feel, um, God has designed us a certain way for a certain sexuality. Uh, And Romans 1 makes the point that's quite obvious from creation, from biology, that that is the case. Um, But again, we are redefining that which only God has the authority to define. And it is Babylon, it's the culture that we're in, flexing its muscles and trying to compete with God for His power. It is wanting to sit on the throne of God as Creator, and redesign the natural order and the world of things which God has already defined. And of course, the end is going to be dreadful misery, and it already is becoming dreadful misery. Um, But this is where we are. Um, Babylon also wants to flex its power and compete with God by taking control of ultimate things, uh, like that only God can control, uh, like the destiny of the planet. I mean, rest in the confidence... This planet isn't going anywhere until God is done with it. Uh, And when He's done with it, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to be fine. Uh, This is a hope that we have which stands in stark contrast to a world of people who wonder how long, who wonder when will it burn, who wonder how fast can we destroy it. 
Babylon is too big for its boots. It wants God's authority. And this is a cultural reality. It's interesting, though, Babylon might have this pride, which is that the self is the greatest thing. It might uh, have this rebellious bent to rule with God's authority. Uh, But also, weirdly enough, uh, there's, there's a strange paradox, which is that it's a culture which, when you scratch below the surface, it's very afraid. Its vaunted pride is a cover-up for anxiety because people know that we are not God. We can never replace God. We can't survive on our own power and our own schemes. The city of Babel expressed this when they admitted that what they were doing was an anxiety response, lest we be scattered abroad across the face of the earth, they said. A world of forces too big for us. Well, yeah, they're not too big for God, but you've forgotten about him. And I just mentioned the climate issue. Uh, I mean, we know that children are going to psychiatrist's offices with anxiety about the destiny of the planet. Um, you know, the reality is, uh, this is the most anxious and depressed generation that the West has ever raised. Uh, even though life has, materially speaking, never been better. Uh, you know, I reflected on that and it occurred to me If I thought that this enormous and unthinkably complex world of cause and effect and forces and powers, you know, that are interstellar and that are are beyond the atmosphere of this world and that, you know, the climate is controlled by things as far away and beyond me as the sun itself uh, and life itself every day is what? It's a random chance occurrence of many things and it's all up to me to find the power and the wisdom and the wits and and the nows to try and navigate through it all and not get taken out by a bus and all the rest of it. If I really thought that it was all up to me in the face of all this, I'd be very scared too. <laughs> and I might not know why. And I think a lot of people don't know why. But the loss of that bedrock that you know there is power and control beyond you is a devastating thing in every Babylon. Uh, praise God these things are beyond my jurisdiction and power, but it's not beyond his. And that's why Jesus could say to his follower, do not be anxious. Isn't that an extraordinary statement? Um, I was about to say it's a bit stressful, but uh, that's, it's, uh, it makes you realise that it must be possible in sanctification to have anxieties diminished uh, and reduced in time. I'm sure it's complex, but it's real, uh, because Christ is in control and we know that he is in control for good. This is The Spotlight, and we've been hearing Martin Isles in part of a series of messages shared during the recent Answers in Genesis Living in Babylon Australian Tour. As Martin says, there is a lot that we can learn from Babylon as a place and also from the metaphor that it became. I'm Jen Spiker, and next time on The Spotlight, we'll hear more of the message that Martin shared to a capacity crowd at the Adelaide Convention Centre. If you can't wait and want to watch Martin's message in full, you can do that right now in the Free Vision app. Just tap the Watch tab and scroll to the Living in Babylon Australian Tour channel for this and more talks in this series. For more great podcasts and videos like the one featured today, check out vision.org.au or the Free Vision app.